pray before we look into God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that all scripture is breathed out by God. and Your word has said that it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. We thank you that you have promised that your word that comes forth from your mouth will not return to you void, but will accomplish that for which you sent it. And we pray for that this morning in the hearts and lives of each one here and in the life of our church, that your word, O oh Lord, would greatly work in the hearts and lives of each one here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some may be wondering why we are not in Ephesians and chapter 1. We will be returning there in a couple of weeks. But for this morning, we want to return to a focus that we have not uh, focused on for a while, and that is this focus on the church at prayer. The church at prayer. Prayer is a, a most wonderful gift of God and a glorious privilege of the believing church to be able to come before the throne of God A gracious God, a merciful God, his throne of grace, where we find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And this is here in our text what we find. The church is in great need, and they go to the right place to meet that need. For what we find is that as the church has been growing, as Jesus had promised that they would be his witnesses in Acts 1-8, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and on to the ends of the earth, The church has been growing, it has been advancing. But as the church grows and as the church advances, what we find is that there is opposition. Because brothers and sisters, there is a spiritual war that we are engaging in. There are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We don't just hear deal with flesh and blood, but we are here involved in a cosmic battle that really was begun in Genesis and will carry on until Christ puts every one of his enemies under his feet. And what we find in the book of Acts then, as the gospel is advancing, the enemies are pushing back. And in Acts chapter 3 and 4, for instance, we find opposition in the way of threats and imprisonment. But the gospel continues to advance. We find in Acts 5, since pressure from the outside doesn't work, the devil begins to work within. And Ananias and Sapphira, in an act of hypocrisy and lies, lie to the Holy Spirit of God about what they have given, thinking to make themselves look good in front of others. Or in Acts chapter 6, we find that if he can't work that way, he works by bringing division among brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Acts chapter 6, what we find there is the widows are arguing with the other widows about who's getting what in the daily distribution of food. And on it goes, as the church continues to advance into Acts chapter 7 and 8, what we find, Acts chapter 8, martyrdom. The others didn't work, and so Stephen is killed and martyred, and yet the word of God continues to advance. And now what we find as we come to Acts in chapter 12... Here in Acts chapter 12, Antichrist government and Antichrist religion join together to persecute the church. What we find here is Herod the king joins together. It says here in Acts chapter 12 and verse 1, At that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now what resulted then, apart from others being, had violent hands laid on them, one of the three of Jesus' closest apostles or disciples is killed. It says then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And what we find is that this seemed to please the Jews, the text says. Which is an amazing thing, really. This religious people had been gathered here at the time for the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover. They were religious people. They were people that believed the word of God, supposedly. They believed in the law of God, the law of God that said, Thou shalt not murder. And yet Herod takes an innocent man, guilty of nothing, and murders him. And these Jews are bloodthirsty, and they are enjoying it. And Herod now, seeing that he's incurring some political favor with the Jews, that his numbers in the polls are going to go up, he thinks, well, look, that worked one time. I think I'll try another. And so what we find then is he takes Peter and he puts him in prison. 
puts him under heavy guard in the prison with the clear intention of executing him as soon as the Passover feast is over because he wouldn't do it during. And so it says in the text, when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. He wasn't going to let him get away intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people, and we know what he intended to do. And so what we find is what we found throughout the history of the people of God. Throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is doing exactly what he said he would do. He is building his church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And yet at times it seems as if the enemies of the church are making such advances against the church that they might wonder whether the whole thing is going to fail. But what is interesting is what Satan means for evil, God uses for good. And what we find here is that trials, tribulations, hardships, and persecutions, though carried out by the enemies of the church to do her harm, are often the greatest friends of the church because they move her to seek the God of the church. When the difficulties and trials press down on the church, they press her down to her knees. And it is there when it seems that she is in her weakest moment, she is really at her greatest strength. And so the church, you see, when she is comfortable, when she is warm and well-fed, how often she proves to be weak and begins to get comfortable with the world, begins to slowly become like the world and be squeezed into its mold, conformed after its likeness. And yet it is times when the difficulties come in life. Don't we find this often personally in our lives? When difficulties and trials come, we may forget prayer for a long time, and all of a sudden things get hard, and it presses us down to our knees. And this is really where the Christian regularly belongs. And we would forget this, but God allows these things, trials and tribulations, to bring us to this place of prayer. And I believe it's helpful for us to take some time to look at these believers and to look at their prayer and and see and learn from what happens here so that we too would be spurred on to get on our knees and pray before our God together. Because what was coming there at the time, this advancing persecution against the church, which would only get worse under Nero in the days ahead, God was going to teach the church a lesson here. And that is that those who are enemies of the church can never succeed against the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, is greater than all. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And if he chooses to allow one of his people, like James here, to die for his glory and for the good of the church, he will do so. But if not, if the days of one of his people has not been numbered and and that God is not yet ready to end, he can do whatever he pleases. And this is what we see here in this text. And it's important because there is a rising tide of opposition to the church of Jesus Christ in our day. And brothers and sisters, if your eyes are open to see it, we can see it all around. We see it in the laws that our government is making that are slowly encroaching on the rights of the people of God to proclaim the word of God. We see it in our institutions. We see it in those who are high up in academia and other things. They absolutely hate and oppose all that is good and right in the word of God. And brothers and sisters, in the days in which we live, of moral and spiritual decay all around us, we find ourselves regularly then facing difficulty both corporately as a church and difficulty in our individual lives. It is helpful for us to see where does the church turn when she faces these kind of things, that the glory of God and the gospel will continue to advance in our day. So I want to draw a couple of of lessons here from what happens in this text. And first of all, I want us to carefully note how they responded, how the church responded. I mean, you think about it. James is dead. His blood is still there. He's just been executed. And now Peter, two of the great apostles, and seems like the other one is going to die as well. How did they respond? Well, they didn't respond with panic, but they responded with prayer, as we have already said. They didn't respond with panic. And it's important that we think about this. When you look at the world around you, it's easy to get anxious. 
But you remember the words of Paul to the Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How do we live in the day in which we live? Not with panic, but with prayer. And so we see that while Herod the wicked king had commissioned four squads of soldiers to keep watch over Peter in prison, the Lord, the gracious king of the church, had commissioned a squad of prayer warriors who spent the night watch in prayer. While Herod was on the throne and was intent on keeping Peter in prison until he could put him to death, these believers came before a greater throne, a heavenly throne, and there they made petitions to the Lord to save Peter's life. And we will see that there is a king on the throne who is greater than all kings. What Herod intended for evil, God would not allow, and their prayers were answered as they came before the throne of grace. Now this morning, then, I want to focus particularly on verse 5. On verse 5, and notice three particular things there in verse 5 about their prayer. Verse 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but... <laughs> Here's a contrast. Peter's in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And so I want us first to notice the first word. It talks about prayer and it says it was earnest prayer. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church, by the ecclesia, by the assembled believers. Earnest prayer to God. And so we see that this was not a rote prayer meeting. It's not called rote prayer where the people came together and just said the same thing they said last week and the same thing they said the week before, and it's kind of the you know second verse same as the first. And they just kind of basically could press play from the week before and out came their prayers again and, and everything else. No, it wasn't rote prayer, nor was it casual prayer. I don't know about you, but I know there was a time, and maybe it still exists in the church today, where people thought that the closer you were to God, the more casual you could be with him. And some people would say, oh, yeah, hey, God, how you doing this morning? And they would begin their prayer this way. Very unlike what our Lord Jesus Christ taught us when they came to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So this wasn't rote prayer, and it wasn't casual prayer. They weren't just lounging around praying, no. And it, nor was it, does it describe the prayer here as orthodox prayer. Although we like doctrinally sound prayer, we want orthodox prayer, but we need more than just mere orthodoxy in our prayers. Here, we long for a Holy Ghost-moved, Spirit-inspired prayer. And this is what we see here in the text. It is earnest prayer. They are in dead earnest. Peter's life hangs in the balance. Tomorrow, Herod intends to murder him. The church then earnestly prays to God to save him. It is earnest prayer. It is strenuous prayer. Prayer, the word here in the Greek, is it's extended out to its fullest potential. It's, it's like um, uh, if you had uh, two people on the sides of a tug-of-war and they're both pulling and the rope is so taut it almost is going to break. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Prayer without slackening. Prayer without letting up. And I want to ask this morning, brothers and sisters, when we go to prayer, is this the way that we pray? If someone could listen in on our prayers this morning, I hope all of us were praying this morning, particularly for me as I come to preach the word of God every week, how I covet your prayers. But is, if someone could hear and eavesdrop in on our prayers, would they say, oh, that, that man, that woman, that young person, they are earnest in prayer. That they may not be the most eloquent person. That they may not, not be the, the one who, who has all the right phrases and all the right things. But there is an earnestness and a passion in this person's prayer. This is the kind of praying that we need to pray for. Not only did the people there live in desperate times and have a desperate situation, but so do we. The world in which we live and the country in which we live, brothers and sisters, is in a desperate situation. 
If God wasn't so patient, we would come fully under his judgment even today. People are so lost. Can you see it? You walk down the streets and their lostness is just seen. You can see it in their faces. You can see it in their dress. You can see it in those who are drugged out. And, and it just keeps increasing day by day. Our young people are lost. Our country is falling further and further away from the Lord. And we need earnest prayer. One old Christian said, cold prayers ask for a denial. You think about that. If someone asks you just casually for something, that's one thing. But when they come earnestly, when they come begging and, and say, oh, but I need this. This has to happen. Please, could you help me? Then all of a sudden our heart is moved. And so it is with the heart of God, that earnest prayer, coming to God. He knows we mean business and he then is moved and, and, and answers our prayer. And we can't, the problem is though with this earnestness, we can't fake it. <laughs> we can't just conjure it up. It is not something that we can just put on by mere external appearances. God hates hypocrisy and he knows it when he sees it. And so this morning, before we move on, I want to ask, how is it that we might be able to stir up an earnestness in our praying? And particularly with respect to the advance of the church in our land and the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can we be aroused to more earnest prayer? And this is very important. There's one time with the late C.H. Spurgeon, they had these great prayer meetings at the Metropolitan Tabernacle during his pastorate there. And one time he noted this, he says this, no wonder that God has not blessed us much lately because we are not fervent in prayer as we should be. Oh, these cold hearted prayers that die upon the lips, those frozen supplications, they don't move men's hearts. How should we expect them to move the heart of God? And so then how can we then pray more earnestly, not only with the mind, but with a fervency of heart? And I wanna give us a couple of thoughts today to think about that might stir us up to pray more earnestly for the cause of God and the church in our country today. And first of all, I want us to see that we must, if we're gonna pray more fervently, be aware of the state of the people of God and the churches in our land. It's one thing to be aware of only the things that are around us, things in our home, things in our family, things that we experience personally, and those might move us to prayer. But how are we going to move to pray that God would revive his church and grow his cause in the land today? We must know the state of the church and the people of God in the land. And here, this is exactly what we see in Acts chapter 12. These people, what if they didn't know that Peter was in prison? What if they didn't know that James had died? They were so busy with their work and everything else, they didn't know what was going on in the church. And some of her greatest leaders were being cut down right before their very eyes. And they might just come two days later and say, oh, did something happen? Oh yeah, James is dead. And Peter's now dead. Maybe if the people hadn't prayed, of course, we know that God had intended this and he works through his means. But we find then they knew, they knew what was going on and because they knew and they knew the desperateness of the situation, it moved them to pray. This is the very thing we find also in Acts chapter four. There was a grand and glorious prayer meeting in Acts chapter four where the Holy Spirit came and shook the entire place in which the believers were praying. But what was it that moved them to pray earnestly in that prayer meeting? Well, what happened was there were reports that came. The believers came and reported to the other believers that the authorities were threatening them and were seeking to gag them from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when they heard this, they got on their knees and they began to pray. And this has always been the case. We must have eyes to see and look around and see what is going on in the church of Jesus Christ in the land. Because as we see it today, as we see the the remnant that has not bowed the knee to Baal, continually decreasing, it seems, and church doors continually closing, or other ones full of people, but worldly people who are doing worldly things that do not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. This will move us to pray. Think about this. This principle is not only seen in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. What we find, let's consider the case of Nehemiah. You may remember how in Nehemiah 1, 
The text in Nehemiah 1 says this, Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So he wants to know, how are the people of God faring at home? I don't know. I'm not there. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And Nehemiah says, well, I'm not there. No big deal. I'm comfortable here in Susa. I'm, I'm doing just fine. No, what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah 1.4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah sees the state of things among the people of God, and he can't help but weep and mourn, but that's one thing. But then he gets on his knees and he looks up and he says, oh God of heaven, come and help your people. And he prays. And so if we wish to grow in urgency and earnestness in prayer, let us meditate on the state of the church of God in our land. Let us note the trouble and shame that she is in. And like Nehemiah, may we contemplate the broken walls, if you will, the gates destroyed by fire. May it awaken our hearts. May it move us to pray like Nehemiah did. Finally, maybe here's another example, and then we'll move on. In 2 Chronicles in chapter 20, you may be familiar there with Jehoshaphat. What happened there with Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20? Well, beginning at verse 1, it records how there were some men who came. Some men who came to Jehoshaphat sounding the alarm because there was a number of armies that were coming up against the people of God. A great horde is how the text describes it. So the people of God were small and not mighty, and this great horde is coming up against them. And what happens? Jehoshaphat hears of this, and what does he do? What does Jehoshaphat do in light of knowing what was going to happen to the people of the Lord? In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, it says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. Now, that would be one thing. We don't want to fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And yet, fear at times is a good thing. Fear when we recognize that what is coming up against us and what is arrayed against us is greater than what we ourselves can handle. No, we as North Americans, we like to handle things. We like to handle things in our own strength and in our own wisdom. But what happens when there's something coming against us that is so great that we can't handle it? When we have an enemy who is greater than us and yet not greater than God. And what happens? He's afraid, it says. This is not a bad thing when it leads to where it led to here. And it says, and then he set his face to seek the Lord. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. For all the cities of Judah, from all of the cities they came to seek the Lord. Three times it says they sought the Lord. This is what is needed in our day. A great seeking of the Lord. An earnest seeking of him. Because the great hordes have come against the people of God. And if we want to see the church of God advance as it did in the book of Acts and mighty victories as we see in the days of Jehoshaphat and Nehemiah as God answered his prayers and allowed him to be part of the solution in restoring the walls at the time, then we need to get on our knees and earnestly seek the Lord. Now secondly, then I want us to see another mark. We've got to move on. Another mark of prevailing prayer that we see in this text, it says then this. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, now what do I see here? Well, what I see is that there was earnest prayer made for a particular man and a particular situation. Particular prayer. Earnest prayer and particular prayer. Direct prayer. Now, this is a very important principle that we must understand, that we must think through. Think about it this way. Here's an illustration. Maybe one of your children is having a birthday soon, and they come up to you, and 
And you say, well, what would you like for your birthday? And, uh, and they would say something like this, oh, benevolent father, we, from whom all good things come, we really would deem that you would give what you believe is good and wise for my birthday in the upcoming days. And that may sound all nice and flowery and everything else, but then you shouldn't be surprised and upset when maybe you get some broccoli on your birthday, <laughs> or you get a chemistry textbook, or a couple of sets of underwear, or something like this, or whatever it is. Right? I mean, if you ask for nothing, or sort of generally speaking, I just, oh, give us what is good, or whatever it is. Okay, well then, this is what you're going to get, and don't be surprised when it happens that way. See, we don't do this with each other. We ask for particular things. We ask directly. We ask specifically. And so it is then with our prayer life. Don't just pray sort of general prayers. Sometimes those things are good. We can pray like in the Lord's Prayer, when the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And now in some ways, that's a massive prayer that involves a whole bunch of things. But in other times in the Lord's Prayer, what we find is that the Lord Jesus didn't just teach his disciples to pray, provide for us. Actually, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Sounds fairly specific. This day, today, daily bread. Or not just guide us, but lead us not into temptation. These are specific requests, particular requests. You know, just as an archer, if he's doing his archery and you went and and talked to him. or A lot of people around here like guns maybe better than bows and arrows or whatever. We go out to the shooting range, you know, and you want to learn to shoot. Well, if you're going to learn to shoot or whatever, and you're shooting, you say, oh, what are you shooting at? Oh, just whatever. Just here and there, you know. Can I, no, that's not the way you do it. There's a target. You want to hit the bullseye. That's the thing. Now, we may miss and we may be off the target, but the desire is to shoot at something specific. And so it is with our prayers. We want to shoot our arrows into heaven, or <clears throat> shoot our bullet prayers there, if you will. And maybe with the gun analogy, we could go one step further. We're shooting at one bullet, not a shotgun. We don't just kind of blast something out there and see whatever it hits. We want to shoot specifically. And here the believers are praying specifically for a specific target. Now, Charles Spurgeon one time, in speaking of those who came to his prayer meeting and didn't pray specifically or particularly, said this. He said, these people's gift lies in being able not to ask for anything in particular. But in passing through a range of everything, making the prayer not an arrow with a point, but rather like a nondescript machine that has no point whatever, and yet is meant to be all point, which is aimed at everything and consequently strikes at nothing. And this is not the way we want to pray. We want to pray specifically, or to put it another way, yeah, that we should not be content in this way. I'll leave that for now. In the Bible, we see then that particular prayers are offered, and they often then receive very particular answers. Particular prayers given particular answers. I want to give four brief examples. Number one, in Acts chapter 4, we've already mentioned it. In Acts chapter 4, the prayer meeting that happened there. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 29, what we see is this. The believers are praying, and they First, let God know of the situation that they're in, in Acts 4, 29. It says, and now, Lord, look upon their threats. So they're threatening the church. They're coming at the church. Lord, look upon these threats. And then it says, and grant to your servants, here's the specific, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Here's the threats. Here's what we would like. Give us boldness to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we need this kind of boldness today. Should we not ask for it specifically? Pray that we would be bold and wise. And what we find then in Acts chapter 4, 31, how does God answer? It says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Ask for boldness Boldness is what comes. Something else was needed, the Holy Spirit of God, to come and fill them so that they would be given the boldness. And so God answers their prayer particularly. Consider Elijah in James 5 and verse 17. It said he was a man with like nature as ours. He prayed fervently. 
for just God's will to be done. No, at the end of our prayers, we can say, Lord, this is what we would like specifically, but may your will be done. At the same time, that doesn't stop us from praying particularly. It said he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And what happened? Voila, three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Particular prayer, particular answer. How about Hannah in 1 Samuel in chapter 1? What we find there, you remember Hannah, she's there. She's deeply distressed, it says in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 1. Deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow to the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but, and then this, will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. I'm not saying that we should only pray for sons. We can pray for daughters. We can pray for whatever. But this is a particular prayer by one particular person. What did the answer come in chapter 1 and verse 19, the second half of the verse of 1 Samuel 1? Elkanah knew his wife. If she was going to have a son, some other things needed to happen first. And the Lord then remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Pray for boldness, get boldness. Pray for rain, you get rain. Pray for a son, you get a son. And here in Acts 12, pray for Peter, and God does something with Peter. Here it is. We have then earnest prayer and particular prayer. Gets a particular answer from God. Always gets a particular answer, maybe a no, maybe a not yet, maybe something else, but God wants us to pray particular, let him know. Now then, in praying for Peter, humanly speaking, Peter was absolutely going nowhere. Herod was carrying out his plans, and it seemed inevitable that Peter would be executed just like James was. Notice verse 6, Acts 12, 6. It says, now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night. So it's just one more sleep and Peter is dead. That's the way Peter had it. Actually, Peter, and notice it says, now Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, and then it says, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Now, I just want to pause there for a minute, and one person noted, and I think wisely so, that the people's prayer was already being answered. He said, how is that so? He's still between two soldiers. Peter is sleeping. If you knew that one of your closest friends just got executed and that, P and that Herod was going and it was a wicked man and was planning to execute you the next day, let me ask you, would you be sleeping? So often I lose sleep over far less things than this, to my own shame. But here, Peter is asleep. I don't think it's just because he's tired. He knows he's in the hands of the Lord. I think the believer's prayer was being answered. And here, though, he is sleeping, bound between two soldiers. And then there's other, and he's got two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. He wasn't going anywhere, humanly speaking. Herod and the Jews were expecting that their plan would be executed, pun intended, and that then Peter would die, and he was going to be dead tomorrow. But while Herod, the king of Palestine, had appointed a small crowd of soldiers to guard Peter in the prison, what do we find? God, the sovereign king of the universe, had appointed another army. God, the king of the universe, had appointed an army of prayer warriors, praying saints, a gathered crowd, to gather together not merely at Mary's house, but before the throne of grace. Verse 12. Verse 12 gives us insight again into our third point, and that is that this prayer was earnest prayer, it was particular prayer, and it was corporate prayer. Corporate prayer. After we're kind of going ahead, we're going to back up in a minute, but it says, when he, Peter, realized this after he'd been released, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. And then it says, where many were gathered together and were praying. The same truth is taught in verse 5, where it says, earnest prayer was made to God for him by the church, the ecclesia, the assembly. And so this is, again, one of the keys. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is to continue to advance against the enemies of the church, there must be regular meetings for corporate prayer. 
to gather together with the people of God, not just to pray alone. There is time for our prayer closets. We must spend our time alone in prayer, but time in prayer together, corporately praying together, earnestly, particularly gathering before God. And this is what we see. You say, well, how did the church advance so much in the book of Acts? It was facing great odds that the wickedness in the world at the time was as great as it is today. There was very little in the way of books. There were very little. There weren't printed Bibles like we have today. Bible schools, Bible colleges, church buildings. None of that was there. And yet they continued to advance. And that is because the church advanced on her knees. And we find, for instance, in Acts chapter 1, if you, we don't have to go back there now, in verses 12 to 14, what do we find the church praying? Christ is ascended into heaven. He says, I'm going to send power, and you're going to be my witnesses, but wait in Jerusalem. And so they're not just sitting there in Jerusalem waiting, they are praying. And it is to these praying saints that on them that God pours out the Spirit ten days later at Pentecost. Prayer. We find in Acts 2, what are they doing? It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. They devoted themselves to praying. Acts 4, the church is being threatened. People are being put in prison. What do they do? They come together. They talk about what's going on, and they get on their knees together in prayer. The apostles in Acts 6, when they were going to be deterred from the things that Christ had commissioned them for over this debate over whose widows were to get what food, they said, we're going to need some people to take care of this, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And brothers and sisters, they, this may be the hardest thing for us to do. Because I believe the opposition hates this the most. There are many things that we can do that we won't be opposed by the evil one, but I believe when we get on our knees in prayer, it's all of a sudden there where things come up and we get distracted. We begin to get really tired all of a sudden when we were wide awake while we were flipping on our iPad or something like this, and all of a sudden our eyes begin to, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We all know. We all know this is difficult. Our, our lives are a testimony to this fact. You want to come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday and all of a sudden all heck breaks loose at home and the, the hot water tank goes and everything else. Why? Because this is a battleground. And the enemy knows that where the church advances most is when she gathers together on her knees before Almighty God because in God we have resources that we do not have on our own. God is our help and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. He is the one that we must turn if we want to see the cause of the gospel advance. See, it's interesting that as many churches in this time of year are beginning to talk about next year's budget, one of the most wonderful things, people have all kinds of money, large sums of money to spend on youth ministries or on this or on that or on the other thing. Because it takes a lot of money to run man's program. Think about it. But it's interesting, you know, even in our church, that we value prayer and want to grow in valuing it more. What you don't find in our budget is a line item that says prayer ministry. Because as far as dollars and cents go, it, it's free. We can come anytime, anywhere, any place. We don't need a fancy room to do it in. We don't need any of this. We just need believers that willingly come together to pray. It costs us nothing to pray, but it has cost the church dearly because she has not prayed. The cost of not praying, oh, brothers and sisters, that's a lot. But the cost of praying, Christ purchased that with the cost of his own blood. He did it all. He's opened a way for us through the curtain that is his body to come before the throne of grace, and he beckons us to boldly come. What a privilege. What a joy. But this is the way the church advances. Particular prayers, earnest prayers, placed together by the church in the golden bowls full of incense before the throne of God. And so what happens as a result of this? Well, we won't read it all, but we see from verse 7 onwards that heaven begins to move. Heaven begins to act. The believers don't storm the prison, but God sends an angel dispatches one of his servants from the heavenly hosts. Peter is there sleeping and light fills the cell. Peter's chains fall off. 
The prison doors open of their own accord. Even prison doors can't stop the mighty power of God. When God says open, they must open. Peter is released. He's set free. And Proverbs 19, 21 comes to mind. Many are the plans in the minds of a man like Herod, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Praise God for this. So while Herod's soldiers and sentries, what are they? A couple of soldiers, a couple of chains, a couple of iron bars compared with all the hosts of heaven and the power of God. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater are the forces of heaven than all the forces of evil that are in the world. You may remember in 2 Kings at the time of Elisha, Elisha and his servant are surrounded by all these worldly armies and his servant, his knees are knocking, wondering what in the world they're going to do. It says, the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning, this is 2 Kings 6, 15, and went out, and behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? We look around at our country and all the hordes of secularism and atheism and evil are, are filling the land today. The laws are squeezing at the church and things are pressing down against us. And we look around and from our worldly eyes, we look and say, what shall we do? Elisha says the right thing. He says, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than are those who are with them. Do you believe that this morning? Brothers and sisters, God is on our side. If God is for us, who can be against us? The hosts of heaven are mighty. The armies are there. More are with us than are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They are there today. Angels, ministering spirits sent to serve on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. They're here this morning. The hosts of heaven, the God of angel armies, he is the one who is with us. We are on his side. We are on the right side of history, brothers and sisters. We need not fear, but we do need to pray. And we do need to come together praying earnestly and specifically Then God would send his armies and send us help from on high, help from his sanctuary that we might then advance his cause. And so what are Herod's plans and schemes in light of the sovereign power of God? In the hands of our sovereign God, what are iron bars? They are just like, if you will, the fresh ropes in the hands of Samson. What are prison doors but like the gates of Gaza? Then he just rips them off and puts them on his shoulders and then walks out of the city. Brothers and sisters, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. And so let's come to him. Let's ask him, what are the things that are, are, are you know, working on your soul today? What are the things that you are fretting about? What are the, the, the things that you seem to not be able to overcome? Or the things that you look at in the lives of your family and your grandchildren and others? Or the things that you deal with at work or in your home or in your relationships? And you go, well, oh God, I, I don't know what to do. I remember a man who didn't know what to do, Jehoshaphat, back in 2 Chronicles 20, and he says, Oh, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. This is the place that we must come. If I look at me, what am I? I can hardly stand up here today. I'm so weak. But it's not me. It's God. We come before God. We serve God. He's still in the heavens, and he still does all that he pleases, and no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Remember the question that is asked of Mary and is asked of Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is obvious, absolutely not. The one who upholds the universe by the word of his power can do all his holy will. And so let us come, let us pray, earnestly, specifically, faithfully, corporately, what is the result of this prayer then? What is the result of this prayer? And we see it in, in verse 12 as Peter lays it out for the people there. Notice what happens. So he gets released as we have already seen. And then it says, when Peter realized what had happened, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. You know, it's interesting that he goes to this house. 
Think about that. Why would he go there? Well, I think that's because that's where the weekly prayer meeting was held. Maybe not, but it doesn't say it in the text. But why would he go to that house in particular on that day? I have a feeling that the prayer meeting was on that day at that particular time. Brothers and sisters, if you come to this house on, on Wednesday nights at 6.45, you'll find that you come to the right place where the praying saints will be found. But he goes on. They were gathered together praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate. She was so amazed, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, praise God, he has answered our prayers. Not in the text. You're out of your mind. That can't happen. It's amazing. Like, thank goodness this is in the Bible. Isn't this just like you and me? We pray, but our faith is so small. Sometimes we're not looking for the answer. We don't look for it. And then when it comes, we're almost like, what in the world? But here it is. You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And so, and then, then they kept saying, well, maybe it's his angel. <laughs> but Peter, not an angel, continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. What's interesting is we shouldn't be amazed when God answers earnest, specific, particular prayer, corporate prayer, particularly in a timely manner and does exactly what you asked him to do. It shouldn't surprise us when Peter and not his angel shows up at the door. And so brothers and sisters, whatever you are facing today and whatever we face in the days ahead as the church of Jesus Christ, let us commit ourselves like these believers to earnest prayer. May God show us. Oh, brothers and sisters, think about it this way. Just think about the people in your family, the people that you love, brothers, sisters, children, relatives, friends, parents who are apart from Christ. Spend a moment thinking about the eternal fires of hell, and that will kindle an earnestness in you. They're lost. They're a moment away from an eternity apart from God. Think about them. Think about the lost. Millions and millions of people never heard the gospel in countries around the world where they have no word of God. And pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field. Pray like Paul asked the Colossians, particularly to pray in Colossians 4.3. He says, at the same time, pray for us that God may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. You see, not many of us will know someone who is in prison around the world for their faith. Although we can gather together to pray for the persecuted church and our brothers and sisters, even though we don't know them by name. But brothers and sisters, every one of you knows people hosts of people, whole city almost full of people who are still imprisoned in their sin, are imprisoned by the devil and his work and are apart from Christ, shackled in sin. And it's interesting that I think as Wesley penned his famous hymn, he was thinking maybe about this very instance as he was reflecting on his own life shackled in sin. And he makes the connection between his imprisonment and sin and the imprisonment that we see here, where he says in his hymn, and can it be, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. But thine eye diffused a quickening ray, and I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Christ died to free sinners from their shackles in sin. Are you shackled today here? Are you imprisoned in sin? Are you still continuing apart from God? Turn to him today. He can set you free. He can awaken you. He can give you light. He can change you today, set you free from your shackles to sin, and make you a loving bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we pray, pray for those of our loved ones who are still in bondage in this way. 
Pray on your own. Pray together. Gather here together corporately that we might pray and that God might perform a mighty miracle, a greater miracle than setting Peter free from his prison cell is someone who is set free from their bondage to the devil and sin and brought into the glorious kingdom of God's light. Brothers and sisters, here then are a few lessons from Acts chapter 12. May God bless them to our hearts and lives as we go into the coming week. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what is a glorious privilege it is to gather before your throne of grace and to come to you even now, O oh Lord. You beckon us to come as a father welcomes his children and says, come to me, spend time with me, pray to me. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that you, through your Holy Spirit of God, O oh Lord, it's so easy to hear these words and to fail. It's so easy to understand the truth and yet, O oh Lord, find it so difficult to carry it out. May you take each of these words, O oh Lord, and may you stir up an earnestness in the hearts of your people here. O oh Lord, may you bring to mind particular things that we can pray that would advance the cause of Christ in our land. And, O oh Lord, may you give us a love and a joy and a desire to gather together with other believers before the throne of grace. On Wednesday night or with the small group that meets on Thursday morning or in other places, O oh Lord, may you cause your people to be a people of prayer. May we be a house of prayer. That your purposes would be accomplished and the church would advance here in our country, O oh Lord. Stir it up across our land. O oh Lord, stir our brothers and sisters in various places to, to rise up and to pray. And may you answer from heaven and may you do great and wondrous things as only you can do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.